I am Lisa Muscatine. I'm one of the co-owners of Politics and Prose. My husband and co-owner, Brad Graham, is right here. Um, and we are really excited to have all of you here on January 20th, 2017, known to many of us as the day before the Women's March on Washington. I don't know what else is going on today. Um, I just want to say that if you are marching tomorrow, I'm sure many of you are. Some of you are already dressed for it, I see. Um, and even if you're not, I want to call your attention to this button that I'm wearing, which is for the Women's March. And uh, just a little quick story. Uh, a couple of women made these buttons. They asked if we would sell them here. They're giving a dollar from each sale, a dollar each to Planned Parenthood and the ACLU. Um, we got several hundred of them a couple days ago. They went like wildfire. We've got met more. They just, everybody loves them. So we want to help them out. And it's a, a really lovely memento anyway. Uh, secondly, if anybody's tweeting, could you please use the hashtag teachin? That's the hashtag we're using for all of our teachins. And um, you don't need to know this in here, but hopefully some of your friends who aren't here are watching <laughs> our live stream on Facebook. Uh, how many of you actually were at the Civil Liberties teachin? Oh, so quite a few of you. And you, many of you came early, I see. Okay, so you got a seat. Um, well, this is our second of a series that we're planning to do here at PNP. Uh, there's really nothing I think that Brad uh, and I and our whole staff have been more excited about in the in the five and a half years that we've owned the store. And I want to um, please give a hand to our incredible uh, events, programs, and marketing teams who have helped put these together very quickly. John Purvis, Liz Hoddle, Justin Stefani, Lily Meyer, Candice Wilkinson, and Davis Shoulders, who are all roaming around <laughs> and who have all done the very heavy lifting um, to pull this off, so thanks to all of them. Um, I also want to say we are so lucky to have these three incredible women with us today. They are um, uh, wonderful people. They are amazing leaders on uh, a range of issues uh, involving women's rights and uh, liberties. Uh, they're also very, very busy, so the fact that they would take the time to come and help us with this uh, means the world to me, but also uh, just a sign of their great devotion to this country and to what we're all trying to accomplish together. Um, and as we all know, as of about four hours ago, reality certainly has set in, but if you haven't checked BuzzFeed, they are now doing an official countdown to the next inauguration. <laughs> Years, months, weeks, days, hours. I'm not sure if they have seconds, but... They do, they do, they have seconds. So when you're feeling really crappy, you can look at it and then you know, an hour later look at it and you'll feel a little bit better. So um, I also want to say that among this enormous, incredible crowd today are some exceptional women who have been inspirations to me, I think inspirations to all of us on this stage, uh, who have been leaders um, in the legal field, in journalism, in academics, in um, writing, in his history, in all sorts of ways, working on Title IX, reproductive freedom, pay equity, political participation, as I said, news reporting, uh, the study and teaching of women's history. I think Betsy Griffith is here. Who's, where are you, Betsy? Back there, <laughs> Betsy. Um, Betsy is an expert on women's history. She wrote a great biography of Elizabeth Cady Stan. But for more important for all of you locals, her new course here at PNP on women and American women in politics is starting next week. So if you're interested, she's a fabulous teacher. Um, we have um, people from all different walks of life who have really made a contribution. I also want to just say, because we're in a bookstore, I have to single out. Uh, my wonderful friend, Elaine Showalter, who is the great women's um, feminist literary critic, probably the greatest feminist literary critic in America. Um, also a huge inspiration to us here at this store. And I'm uh, Marsha Greenberger, who's, the, who's Fatima's boss, actually, right? <laughs> and then Duffy Campbell from the National Women's Law Center. I'm sure I am forgetting other very important people, but thank you all for coming. And mostly thanks to all of you who are here as concerned citizens, honestly. Uh, women and men who care so deeply about our country and its future, who are willing to come out here, stand amidst the crowd, probably die of asphyxiation um, in the process, but hey, it'll be worth it because it's for a good cause. Um, 
I really uh, think you're making an incredible statement, and we are so gratified that uh, by hosting this, we have been able to draw so many people who are interested in, in trying to help us move ahead. So thank you all for coming. Uh, just very quickly, for those of you who weren't at the last teach-in, a, a quick word about why PNP decided to do these teach-ins. It, it really started with the election, and so many customers coming up to us afterward and just saying they wanted to be in the store, they came to the store, it was the first place they went after the election because they felt the bookstore was a refuge. And it was a refuge where people feel safe, where they can exchange ideas, where they can have honest, respectful discourse. And um, we really started thinking, what more can we do as a community institution? Um, and we decided, you know, okay, Brad and I are dating ourselves, but you know, we did, we were alive and conscious in the '60s, um, <laughs> and obviously uh, had that experience in the in the back of our minds. And we thought, why don't we do some teach-ins? Our staff got very excited. We have been very lucky to have such willing panelists join us to help make these um, so interesting. Um, and that's what we're going to do, and we're going to keep doing them. Um, we're going to do an, one on. Um, climate change, immigration, the future of political parties, education. We'll be looking at a whole range of issues uh, over the next uh, months, and who knows, maybe years. So uh, just stay tuned for that. Yo, thank you for coming, thank you for coming. Um, lastly, we are gonna be putting reading lists up for each teach-in on our website with recommendations from our panelists and from our staff. We also have a dis display table with books that we recommend. Uh, you'll see Rebecca's books um, on those tables already. Uh, I wanna call your attention to one other book. It just came out, it's called What We Do Now, Standing Up for Your Values in Trump's America. This is an interesting book to me because it just came out in the last week or so, if, if that. Um, and it's published by Melville House, which is one of the small, really good, very fine publishing houses in America, very crusading uh, publisher named Dennis Johnson. And he put this together. It's a collection of essays from progressive thinkers and writers um, in time for the inauguration. Um, and we have, a I think we still have a bunch of copies, but we'll be getting more in if you're interested in that. And I do highly recommend that. Um, Okay, so here's how this is gonna work. I'm gonna stop talking, and I'm gonna introduce our panelists. I'm gonna pose a few starting questions to each of them, and then we very much would like to open it up to all of you. It's obviously gonna be hard to get to these two microphones at the front, but we are gonna have one intrepid staff person. Candace, I think, is gonna be trying to <laughs> make her way. Oh, Lily, oh, sorry, Lily, back there, is gonna make her way uh, to try to get you if you have a question, just raise your hand. And we, by the way, those of you in the fiction room uh, next door, we'll also try to make sure you get a question in from back there. Um, but let me introduce these, uh, these great women who, um, who are on the stage with me. First of all, uh, I'll start with Rebecca Traster, who's in the middle. Uh, she's writer at large for New York Magazine, contributing editor at Elle. She's written, I think most of you know, about politics and women and uh, also entertainment and media through a feminist lens for The Nation, The New York Observer, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Vogue, Glamour, and Marie Claire. She's a prize-winning uh, journalist and writer. Um, I, I happen to think, and of course I'm totally unbiased, that she is um, probably the most insightful and compelling journalist writing about women in America today. And um, um, her first book, I hope all of you have read, called Pig Girls Don't Cry, the best book about the, 20, the 2008 election. Uh, was a New York Times notable book of 2010. It was also won some prizes. Um, as I mentioned, her second book called, I don't think I mentioned the title, All the, Sing all the Single Ladies. It came out last year. And just on a personal note, I got to know Rebecca in 2008 during the presidential campaign. I think many of you know that I work for Hillary Clinton for a long time. Um, and I went and I heard Rebecca, I didn't know Rebecca, and I heard her speak on a panel. And um, I was just completely struck by the, her, the independence of her thinking, her intellectual rigor in the midst of, you know, everybody trying to just rush to deadline and say whatever was the most impulsive thing. Um, and um, of course her passion. And so we started talking then and I'd say we haven't really stopped. So we're still talking. And uh, if you never read her profile of Hillary, by the way, in New York Magazine that came out last spring, it is the finest piece, finest profile of Hillary Clinton to date. So you might want to take a look at that. Um, just in some, the woman is brilliant. So thank you for coming. Um, 
Right next to me, Fatima Goss-Graves is a lawyer and senior vice president for program at the National Women's Law Center, where she leads the organization's efforts to eliminate barriers in employment, education, health, and reproductive rights, and lift women and families out of poverty. She's also led the center's anti-discrimination initiatives, including efforts to promote equal pay, combat harassment and sexual assault at work and at school. You might want to go to the White House. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and said, we might. Oh, that, I'm sorry. I hope I didn't offend anybody. Um, and uh, advance equal access to education programs with a particular focus on outcomes for women and girls of color. She got her start in law as a law clerk for Judge Diane P. Wood of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, and later worked as an appellate and trial litigator. She currently serves on the EEOC Select Task Force on the Study of Harassment in the Workplace, is a Ford Foundation Public Voices Fellow and an advisor on the American Law Institute Project on Sexual and Gender-Based Misconduct on Campus. Uh, with that incredible resume and with the obvious brain power that it represents, I'm thinking we could kind of use you on the Supreme Court right about now. <laughs> but that, I know, whatever. Okay, we're not gonna go there, Never mind. I'm sorry, that was, that was probably cruel to even mention it, but you know, but it would be good, right? It'd be great. Um, lastly, uh, last but not least at all, my dear friend Jennifer Klein. Jen and I first met in 1993. We were both working in the Clinton White House where she served on the President's Domestic Policy Council and was and has been for many years a top advisor to Hillary Clinton. Uh, she worked on the implementation of the, uh, well, she worked on health care reform, then the implementation of, of CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program on Child Care, Adoption and Child Welfare, Early Childhood Development and Education. Let's just say that Jen and I have been through many political ups together and also a few downs over the last couple of decades. I would have to say Jen today is one of the low marks in all the time we've known each other, but on the bright side, knowing Jen has, uh, and knowing that Jen will remain involved in all these fights is uh, indeed makes me feel better. Um, she's a lawyer also, and in addition to her work at the White House, she was a senior advisor on women's issues to Hillary for America. She handles both domestic and global women's policy issues. It's very rare for people to be experts in both. She is one of the few experts in both. Uh, she's also an adjunct professor at Georgetown Law Center. Before the campaign, she helped develop and implement No Ceilings, an initiative at the Clinton Foundation to evaluate progress for women and girls around the world. Uh, during the Obama administration, she was at state for four years as deputy and senior advisor in the Office of Global Women's Issues. Um, and she worked on uh, all, really kind of helping to change the paradigm um, with respect to foreign policy and women. So that was a huge contribution. Uh, she is also one of the really smartest people I know, but even more important, she is one of the nicest and very best human beings on the planet. So I just wanna thank all three of you for being here. Okay. Thank you all. Okay, now, now to the actual questions. Thank you for being so patient. Um, I'm gonna start with Rebecca because Rebecca had to travel the furthest to get here. She just got in <laughs> from New York. So she's gonna get to go first. So I'm just gonna put it out there. This has been a very hard day for some of us. I know it has been very hard for me. I'm sure it's been very hard for many of you in the room. I know for me uh, personally, um, having worked for Hillary for many, many years, but also just as a woman, as a mother. And by the way, where's Wynn? My daughter is here somewhere. Oh, my God. She's right in front of me, and I didn't see her. She's here, so she's another, you know, they've got to carry on this fight for us, or with us. Um, uh, so this has been a tough day, just as November 8th was a tough day. And so let's look back just for a second. Hillary was the first woman nominee of a major party. Historic accomplishment. Uh, she was, by every metric, one of the most qualified people ever to run for president. She ran against a man, on the, you know, by, by contrast, who boasted of groping women, who continuously referred to women in degrading terms, and moreover, seemed completely uninterested in the range of issues that speak directly to the lives of women and girls. Um, today, we watched the woman who might have been president watch this man become president. Um, and that was because in the end, I mean, not this is not the only reason, but one of the reasons was that in the end, uh, more than half of white women in this country voted for him, not for Hillary. Um, she never fully connected to younger women in this campaign. So Rebecca, the easy softball for you. Um, <laughs> what does this election tell us about the state of feminism in America at this moment? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, um, well, I think that the, I mean, the, the biggest and simplest answer is that what it tells us about the state of feminism in the United States right now is that it is completely in line with the history of feminism over the two plus centuries that it has existed in its many forms in this country. And when I say that, what I mean is that internal tension and dissent, um, internal cacophony, um, competing interests, um, anxieties about race, class, uh, religion, generational tensions, disagreements about how to proceed, um, where to move forward and in what direction, um, are a hallmark of the women's movement in every form it's ever taken in this country. Um, that internal dissent is not a bug, it is a feature of a movement that represents over half the population. And, you know, I've, I've always thought, and, and I've actually tried in the years that I've written about feminism, and I do believe this, um, I think it is uh, to feminism's benefit that it is as roiling as it is with internal difference and, and dissent. There are moments when 53% of white women vote for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton in which it's really hard to see how <laughs> that dissent um, is useful. But one of the things, and, and, and I actually was just writing a story um, a, a, a quick story about the Women's March and how the coverage has been marked by, the media coverage of the Women's March leading into it has been marked by coverage of the dissent, the tension, the disorganization. If you've read about the Women's March, you've probably read about internal organizational tensions. Did they get permits? Um, did they permit anti-choice groups to come? Uh, is there racial tension between the white women, you know, who conceived of the idea and that was a bad and appropriated the name of, of black marches versus the women of color who took it over and really organized it into this massive historic event. Um, just in the past 24 hours, there has been um, coverage of the, the dissent over the fact that Hillary Clinton's name was left off the list of women that the march is meant to honor. Um, and you've probably read all of that. You've probably read all of that. Um, but you've read all of that and yet probably not read anything that just says, look, there is the biggest um, mass mobilization, <laughs> and, it, and it happened over a period of 11 weeks between people who'd never met each other. It was swift to self-correct. Oh, it was sort of, a, you know, people who didn't have enough experience organized it was going to be this, this white lady march was a very bad idea, appropriating the names of black-led marches from the past, very bad idea, corrected it, you know, and, and we have a 600, 600 marches around the world taking place tomorrow, including 40 internationally. <laughs> right. And but, but we always have to hear about how the bad stuff comes first, right? Like they probably didn't get the right permits and they blah, blah, blah. And you know, some of that is, and, and it's rooted in truth. And when I was writing this story, I called Gloria Steinem. Um, I also, I talked to several of the organizers and one of the people that I spoke to about some historical perspective was Gloria Steinem who pointed out to me this very simple thing that makes perfect sense. One of the things about the, home, about the women's movement that has meant that it's always been marked and shaped by internal dissent is that it is not the movement of an oppressed minority. It is a movement, uh, it is a majority movement. And that means it is, it is a movement that aims to further the, the progress of over half of our population. There is no way that it could be pat and coherent uh, in its strategy and direction because it aims to represent the, the needs and perspectives and experiences of women who come from entirely different places with different, um, you know, intersecting identities and priorities and, and perspectives and views. And, and, and in fact, the ways in which we focus on the dissension and the, dis the, the division, Gloria pointed out, is the way that it's, if you're talking about minority rule, like colonial rule in countries, what you do is that minority rule comes in and divides the majority that they're oppressing by setting them against each other, um, by race, by gender, by age, by class, by religion. That's how you maintain rule. It's one of the ways that in a funny way, the 2008 election was a far more comfortable election for b those on the right and the left because there was a, a terrible but also somehow very comfortable competition between race and gender as if the two aren't threaded together and, and woven together. The Barack Obama versus Hillary Clinton election, um, which was very painful for many people, but was also sort of comfortably a American. One of the things that was so discomforting and I think revolutionary about what we just saw was, was the idea of a woman succeeding a black president and doing so alongside him and his wife 
with a campaign that, and this has been talked about as its error, that focused on women and people of color as the people they assumed had the power to elect them, not on white men. Which we are now told was the terrible error that they made, right? <laughs> but this, the idea that that, those marginalized groups might work together was so threatening, and I think nobody really absorbed how threatening those dynamics were. And so when you hear about all the ways in which feminism is in big trouble because, you know, granddaughters and grandmothers disagree about, you know, their, their priorities and what they should do next and what's right and wrong about feminism, or because there is um, contentious um, fighting about, about race and identity and, and how you shape and present feminist priorities and um, that stuff, right, that's supposed to be there. That shows that feminism is healthy. What we need to do is do the harder work of getting past that because it is, I mean, not, I, I don't, this sounds weird like Hillary Shilly, but it actually is really powerful, the stronger together message. The fact is we are weakened by the division and, and that the, the way forward has to be finding, finding our way through those conversations, not around them, not pretending they don't exist, but but through them and on to some kind of cooperation and ability to persuade, and which we have to do for the 53% of white women. It needs to be a persuasive and inclusive um, conversation. And we don't need to, we can't be getting hung up on the fact that we're all mad at each other, you know, because we're different. Yeah. Um, well, that's sort of building on that, Fatima. Um, um, and this march tomorrow, which, which many people here are focusing on. Um, you, as Re Rebecca said, there's been fascinating news coverage of this march. Rebecca just said it's been you know, mostly critical. Uh, there was an interesting piece in The New Yorker a day or two ago um, online that was actually pointing out how it's mostly been critical. Um, you yourself wrote a really uh, a, a great uh, piece today in US News that talks about why you think the march matters, why you are participating, and um, sort of in the aftermath of all this commentary about it. So I'm wondering if you could just take, go sort of go from where Rebecca left off and talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and I, well, first of all, I hate talking after you, Rebecca, because you're, just, <laughs> you're so good. <laughs> so I, there's a couple of things. The first is that um, all, there's disagreement in every movement. Right there, you know, and there sometimes are stories written about that disagreement in the racial justice movement, in the disability movement, in the environmental movement, and beyond. But the way in which uh, the women's movement is critiqued for having robust disagreement around strategy um, is unique. So I, I think we just have to stop there and notice that. But. I fully agree that over the last, to put in less than three months this remarkable march together, that um, in many ways, and this is one of the things that I was really trying to write about in, uh, about why I'm marching, and that is that in rapid time, they put together a framework and an approach that I think is what the women's movement has really been aiming for, for decades. They started and they said, it's important that it be multiracial and that the organizers be multiracial and that we listen to each other and that we understand that women have multiple identities and we're gonna put that front and center. And then they outlined a platform that is robust and that names issues that have traditionally been aligned with the women's movement and those that haven't been traditionally aligned with the women's movement. And they said, this is important and here's why. They, they explained that for us. They sort of walked us through and said, this is important because one, women are in or deeply affected by all of these issues and so that we all need to know that and name that. Uh, and two, and, and I think for me, because I'm thinking of this as day one, uh, 
day one and day one of resisting efforts to undermine our civil rights, our human rights, our reproductive freedom is going to require all of us to be deeply connected. So just as that platform is naming that these issues are interconnected, that they're intersecting and that they're all women's issues and important, the resistance has to look like that too. And so women have to show up collectively because women and broader people are affected, but the broader progressive movement has to show up as well. And that includes spaces where the broader progressive movement hasn't always collectively shown up. They'll have to show up around reproductive freedom when, it, when it's attacked. They'll have to show up when violence against women and violence generally is undermined and gutted. And so I think building that framework building it rapidly and stumbling, and that's how we do, but building that framework is the first step necessary for the, the, the work of resisting going forward. You know, that's so interesting. Um, one, of the, um, one of the takeaways from the civil liberties teaching that I, that I, and one of the things I took away anyway, was this idea, and it was actually very helpful to me, and I think it's sort of what you're saying, both of you, um, is that, uh, these movements are organic. You know, they, they happen and people are fretting because there's not a leader or there's not, as you say, great um, harmony over every issue. And it doesn't really matter because they take shape because people get involved. And those things have to sort of be sorted out as you go to some degree and they have a kind of organic thing. So that's sort of, I think, what both of you were saying. Um, Jen, um, you have worked on policy issues in a very deep way for many, many, many years. Um, you obviously were immersed in the policy aspects of the of the Hillary campaign and, and helping her develop, um, by the way, very detailed, thoughtful, realistic plans that you could afford to pay for on a range of issues, including many women's issues. Um, not that anybody paid attention, but whatever. Uh, I'm just wondering, looking ahead though, you know, it's hard, especially today, to feel there is cause for hope. And I'm wondering if there is any kind of cause for hope or if we're just kind of about to enter this long, dark, four-year tunnel that we're going to get to the end and there'll be like maybe a sliver of light? Or is it going to be a little better than that? So I like to think about three challenges and one opportunity or sliver of light, to use your words. Um, so first, we need to think about the immediate risks. Um, starting with regulatory action, right? So in the Obama administration, there was an amazing amount of progress um, through regulatory action on a range of issues like sexual assault on college campuses and elsewhere, economic issues like paid sick days and equal pay, and on global women's issues, really integrating um, women's issues through the work of our foreign policy and national security. And so one big question, which we can't answer today, but is what will they take on early through regulatory action? I mean, one thing we know they will do is um, reinstate the global gag rule, which prohibits non-governmental organizations from, um, that receive US family planning dollars from even um, talking about discussing or advocating for abortion, let alone providing abortion services. That may even be happening today um, or probably on Monday in the anniversary of the Roe versus Wade decision. Um, second immediate risk um, are budget cuts. So we've already heard um, that they are thinking about defunding Planned Parenthood, eliminating violence against women grants, and many other programs, um, some expected and some not even expected, um, that will affect many, many women. Um, and the third immediate risk is uh, no surprise to any of us, um, but the immediate legislative priorities, the most obvious of which is the repeal of the Affordable Care Act. So, you know, as we know, millions of women and their families um, risk losing health care, um, which includes things like basic preventive services, birth control, and they'll pay higher premiums. And of course, this is a risk to all women and families, um, but it is a particular um, concern for women of color and low-income women um, who you know, will both suffer health consequences and economic consequences if health uh, premiums go up or if they lose health insurance entirely. 
Um, so those are the immediate risks. Um, the second thing I would point to is sort of long, what I term long-term erosion. Um, you know, one example of this are the appointments that we can expect. So first, you know, the diversity or lack thereof of diversity in the federal workplace. Um, judges and justices down the road, and of course, we're all waiting um, and have now heard that maybe even in the first week, a nomination for the um, Supreme Court vacancy. Um, and then, you know, the, the other piece of the long-term erosion, as I said, is, you know, these sort of cuts to important safety net programs. Um, and the third risk is, law, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm making people sad already. <laughs> um, I'm going I'm to get We're to the small sad. sliver. Um, the third risk is lost opportunities. So either by not taking action on things that are vital to women, things like equal pay, minimum wage, um, global economic participation, um, which are you know things that vast majorities of Americans agree with and think are important, um, or by taking inadequate action. And I think it's really important um, to point this out. So you know there are areas where you could take a small step, which might sound good, and will be really hard for um, Democrats on the Hill to stop. But in the end, they might do more harm than good. The most obvious example for me is paid leave. Um, you know, to, in my view, if we end up with two weeks of paid maternity leave mm -hmm. instead of a longer period of paid parental leave, I think we risk um, foreclosing action in the future. Um, so to me, that's a big, a big issue. Child care is another one, a little bit less of a worry. It's, it has been a bipartisan issue. There are things you can do to really mess up child care, but you could also just make smaller investments, and that's <laughs> not an insignificant possibility. But, but paid leave sort of is the thing I wake up in the middle of the night. Um, and those who know me know that I literally wake up thinking <laughs> in the middle of the night about things like paid leave. Um, but there are areas for progress, um, and I think you know one of the things, and you've already heard this from from Fatima and Rebecca, is that we have a new commitment to action. I think very few people are going to be complacent, um, and so you know the the opportunity is for organizing, for raising awareness um, among the grassroots, particularly among millennials and younger people who. Um, you know, saw what happened in this election when you don't vote, when you don't um, get out there for the, the causes that you believe in. Second area of progress is state and local action. So, you know, already around the country, we've seen in the last um, several years ballot initiatives on things like child care and elder care, paid leave, and minimum wage. And I think that becomes more important than ever. But it's there, and there's a lot of work to be done. And then the third piece um, I would point to is philanthropic support. You know, they, there are private sector actors who um, have been very, very helpful in the past and important partners to, to, to the government. Um, but I think there's a, a very um, deep understanding that um, the private sector needs to st step up even more. Um, and all accounts are that they are more than willing to, to do that. You know, so I guess for, for T to summarize a bit, I, I think that you know most people in this room feel a um, the the deep opportunity that we lost by having our first woman president. Um, you know, for some people, and I'm guessing it's not the people in this room, this election was a wake up, um, a sort of visible sign of barriers that they didn't think existed anymore. Um, and I think we're all deeply worried about the threats to women's rights and equality. Um, you know, it's difficult to absorb for, for me, but I think for all of us, the contrast between what will be done or undone in a Trump administration and what we had expected would be done in a Clinton administration. Um, for example, on everything from reproductive rights to health care to child care and all the economic issues. Um, you know, I always point out that when I worked for um, the first, the then first lady in the early 90s with Lissa, she used to refer to issues like child care and equal pay and paid leave as uh, economic issues. Mm -hmm. And most people referred to them as women's issues. And I think we um, have made a lot of progress in seeing them, many, many more people seeing them as, as economic issues. Um, so I think it's important to to um, to acknowledge that we have lost a huge opportunity, um, but there is there's a little bit of hope. There's um, there's strong support even among Trump voters for a lot of these issues. Um, a recent poll came out just yesterday, the day before, and I read it first with um, a lot of anger, 
and then a little bit of hope um, because I'll, I'll just give you a few examples. It said that nine in 10 adults, including 79% of Trump voters, reject an agenda that includes defunding Planned Parenthood and opposing abortion. So of course my first reaction was, where, what were you thinking? Um, and I, I didn't say it quite that nicely um, as I read it to myself. Um, but you know, they're for some of the things that we're for. Um, 89% were for um, access to affordable child care. 67% don't uh, oppose nominating a Supreme Court justice based on his, his or her belief in restricting or eliminating a woman's right to, to choose. So you know what I think we know is that Donald Trump does not have a mandate, and I choose to read the support for these issues as our mandate. Jen, something that you just said, you said, you know, that, that you doubt there's a, a lot of complacency, and obviously this room would certainly provide evidence of that. And I just want to say, just to, I forgot to say this at the beginning, and I sort of believe it, but whatever. Um, we are doing these teachings not to be partisan, but to be principled, and it's very important for us as an independent bookstore just to assert our principles. Obviously, these are all our principles. Obviously, sometimes principles intersect with politics, and I just want to say, were it not Donald Trump as president, I don't think we would have thought about having teach-ins. And if we did have teach-ins, we'd probably have three people show up. So I think um, at the last teach-in, David Cole from the ACLU made the point that there is nothing that mobilizes and galvanizes people more than a common enemy. And whatever the political party and partisan stripes, this is really to us a kind of an assault on values and on the foundations of this republic. And so that's sort of where we're coming from. And I think that is the, the energy right behind it. Did you want to say something, Rebecca? Go ahead. Well, I also just wanted to add to that that I think one thing I never want to lose sight of is the fact that we have Donald Trump because we had, and I'm not, not just Hillary, but uh, eight years of Barack Obama, the nomination of Hillary Clinton running thanks to the primary with Bernie Sanders and thanks to the kind of grassroots activism on paid leave, on minimum wage, on things like reversing Hyde that permitted the Democratic candidate, who happened to be a woman succeeding, trying to succeed a black man, um, and thanks to the left pressure from, from Bernie Sanders, who helped to galvanize the shift, but it wasn't just Bernie. It really is that you've had these this grassroots, paid leave was like a third rail pipe dream five minutes ago. But, uh, no, now it is again. <laughs> five minutes ago it was a legit dream. Okay, but, um, but really up until a few years ago, I mean, Hillary Clinton herself said a couple of years ago when she was on book tour that she didn't think it could happen because it was so, there were just, there had been doors closed to this. But it was, activists in states and cities around the country that have been getting these measures passed New York passed paid leave these are these like the the fight for 15 these are grassroots efforts not coming from the top of any party coming from the bottom and they've been so successful that they've pushed the issues up to the top where you happen to have the most diverse roster of candidates for presidential and for for legislative positions that we've ever seen and that all together is a kind of threat to the I mean, white male power structure on which this country was built, that it managed to produce a demon to fight it. I mean, it is not a quirk that Donald Trump was the candidate in, in this election. This was, and, and during the Republican convention, I say this all the time, it was as it was coming out of his mouth, I knew that this was the truth of it. Rudy Giuliani, in his Mussolini speech, says, <laughs> there is not another election. This is the last election. And it actually, and this is something we should feel good about, <laughs> because it, is the, it was the rising threat. The fact that support for Roe v. Wade is at a record 69%, according to Pew from a poll from last week. The kinds of numbers that Jen's reading, this is reflecting that the country is shifting left. That's why we have the guy who's a monster of the right. And, and, and we have to remember that that left vision was more popular, <laughs> won 2.8 million more votes. So, so that is, I mean, that doesn't make the consequences that we're talking about any less because minority rule is for real. And in fact, we'll try to strangle all of that. But, but that is something we can feel good about, that, that those, that's where it came from. It wasn't just about Hillary. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just about Bernie. And it wasn't just, it was, it's about what gave them the space to have the kind of election that we just had. Yeah, no, very interesting. 
Um, just Fatima, I'm sorry I'm making you talk after Rebecca again, but, but you're fine, you're awesome. She's gonna regret talking after you next time. Um, no, I just sort of, so, so one question to follow up that I think you would uh, have real insight in. In thinking about how a resistance happens and how progress is made, how these rights are not just protected but hopefully expanded upon, um, obviously citizen action is essential. There's no question. Uh, in fact, if any of you, those of you who are at the, the Civil Liberties Teach and heard the repeated message that uh, citizen act activism is where things happen, not so much the courts or in the legislative arena. And I want to ask you about that because you've operated mostly in the legislative and judicial arenas. Do you feel that those two arenas are places where things can happen now? Or is it going to really be entirely uh, citizen driven or is it citizen driven that's going to affect those two? And it's probably the, that last point. They're deeply related because when I think about these campaigns that have prompted state and local governments to really rapidly change their laws on things like equal pay and paid sick days and paid, uh, paid family medical leave and uh, you know re protecting reproductive health decisions and even you know additional child care investments, those things happen really fast. If you just look back between uh, 2014 and 2017, you saw a doubling of the number of states who were doing that. And, and those were absolutely because there were deep organized campaigns pushing for those things. But it was also that you had this reinforcing thing happening with the federal government, with the Department of Labor, and the Obama administration's ex executive orders. So those things were playing off each other. So those people who were motivated to press their state and local legislators for really deep policies on these issues, they haven't gone away. One, and they're not going to sort of sit quietly while the Trump administration undoes all their, these gains, right? So the first thing is about making visible what happened. On my way over here today, I saw that the Department of Labor's information on LGBT employment information has just, it's gone off the website, right? And so that will be noticed. There's no quiet backtracking. And we will see that in other spaces for sure. So the first is that everyone knows what's happening. The second piece of this is, you know, <laughs> and it, I am a lawyer, so, but there is a constitution still. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we have a lot of landmark civil rights laws that have been around for 40, 50 years. And so if they take steps to say that, you know, that whole ban against sex discrimination means the opposite of what we said it what meant last week, uh, there are legal avenues to challenge that. You know, things can't always just happen willy-nilly, even if they say it. You might see them out there saying that I'm going to undo everything right away and there's nothing that can stop me. Well, I disagree. I think the people have a thing to say about that. I think the law has a thing to say about that. The, the other thing, and I've been thinking deeply about the Supreme Court, you know, we had, yeah. we had Judge Merrick Garland waiting around for eight months and not even having a hearing. And so, we, you know, we, we just, I can't get that out of my mind, right? Um, but at the same time, we've heard that there's big plans to appoint someone who's going to be extreme. That's the only thing we've heard that this person will be extreme, don't worry. We already know that no matter what, this person will undermine Roe v. Wade because that is their agenda. And, you know, on the other hand, um, you have the people who have the ability to weigh in and say, you know what, we don't want a Supreme Court justice who's extreme. We don't want someone who has a disdain for civil rights laws or an agenda. And, and that sort of weighing in matters because although it did not happen in the case of Mayor Garland, the Senate has a constitutional role and duty here. And so th they should hear starting now from, uh, from people about what it is that you expect to happen in this process and that this is a serious process. Uh, and then the, the last thing that I want to say is that I, I mentioned those landmark civil rights laws because 
you know, you may have been seeing that in the period following the election, and this is just one example, there has been an increase in discrimination and hate crimes happening in schools, even in elementary schools. And so at the time when our schools and when our institutions sort of need a strong, robust civil rights enforcement presence, um, you know, we're hearing talk of cutting back on civil rights, that that's an area of the budget that should just be cut and undermined. So those laws, they still exist, and groups like the National Women's Law Center are, are going to be there, we'll be leading with an attorney network, we will be taking cases, and we'll we, be, we will be standing up when we see um, this administration step over the line. Mm -hmm. But, and do you think that, or do you agree with Jen that the level of outrage now is really the difference. Let's say, you know, with, with Merrick Garland, obviously we were all, you know, people who supported Obama, it was an Obama appointee, people weren't that riled up yet. I mean, we were all sort of looking at Trump like, oh my God. But now, does, is now different somehow, do you think? I think, I, th I look at this room and I say there's a difference. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, you know, the, people are, and you know, people are awake. <laughs> and they're paying attention. And you know, the, the polling that has come out that suggests that people liked all of these policies and they did not and do not expect to have an erosion, it's extremely important that we tell that story, that we make sure that people know where there have been the types of changes that they don't support and that they didn't expect. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just want to say we'll start with audience questions in a minute. So if you can make it to a mic and have a question, that would be great. And if not, uh, I'll ask you after I, I want to ask Rebecca and Jen each a quick uh, second question and then uh, turn it over. But if you will raise your hand after that, if you have a question, I'll, I'll, we'll try to find you with a microphone. <laughs> um, uh, Rebecca, um, we just were talking sort of about movements in the collective sense and what this election has said about the movement, as it were. And I'm wondering, um, we've talked a little bit about this, but w can you just be a little more granular about what a women's, I'm assuming we all think there should be a women's movement, but um, how that movement actually will take shape and what it will look like at a slightly more granular level? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that one of the challenges that's going to be ahead of a women's movement, and especially an intersectional um, and more unified women's movement, which I think we need and we are in the process, things like this march and and like the election itself, I feel like, especially at the end of the campaign was getting us toward that. One of the challenges that it faces is that there are so many fronts to look, there are so many directions to look at in once at, at once. So there is the the rollback of reproductive autonomy, which is in itself you have to look in fifteen directions. You have to look at Title Ten, you the, the Planned Parenthood defunding, the repeal of the ACA, and specifically the repeal of the contraceptive mandate. Then you look at state laws, state legislatures where they're passing new and invent ever more inventive kinds of bans. Um, you have to look toward Supreme Court nominations. I mean, that, that in itself is such a multi-tentacled multi threat. Then you are looking at issues like immigration, deportations, um, criminal justice reform. All of these things are feminist issues. All of these things disproportionately impact women and women of color um, specifically. Um, and so, and, and because the assault that we're about, I fear that we are really now in the midst of, I guess, experiencing, is gonna be in all those directions, I think that that there's the granular response is we have to do a little bit of everything but that the challenge for those of us who are interested in our own directions is to try to keep communication lines open and messaging out there about how this is part of a women's movement right so this is i'm, I'm probably not actually answering the question that you want me to answer which is what do we do individually no no, no you're answering it i okay, actually good. was asking you more what a sh what a collective movement would look like i mean fatima had talked um about the need for a broader, for the women, but also more a broader progressive movement to embrace these issues as well, which even goes beyond a woman's movement. Right. And I was, I, I just, because there's been so much discussion about sort of the state of the quote woman's movement, I was, I just, yeah, no, you're answering it. I perfectly. think the key, and I, I don't know what the, f I don't know what the method is except open lines of communication, not being afraid of the things like argument. 
understanding that that's part of the communication and keeping an eye if if we can begin to feel better about a feminist movement and understand that it is uh, raucous and diverse <laughs> um, and to for uh, the challenge is for all of us who will be working in all these different avenues to talk to each other um, whether you're volunteering whether it's your profession that is you know whether whether you are working on um, legal address of this or whether you are um, offering your time or donating money to be in communication and to stay curious about and to listen to other people and seek out other people who are doing other things but possibly also with an eye toward getting us closer to gender equality and also unfortunately protecting what we have so far. We're also moving in those two directions on all these fronts. It's gonna be continuing to try to find a way to imagine moving forward at the same time that we are trying to stop ourselves from sliding back. So I guess my only answer is about trying to communicate, not just telling people what we're doing, but asking other people what they're doing. Um, and really all of us working to conceive on how these different things are fundamentally part of a united project. And that leads directly to what I want to ask you, Jen, actually, um, because I do think a lot of people, especially today, feel a little dejected and uh, frustrated, maybe a little bit powerless. And yet, I think we, you know, I've, my daughter will tell you that I kept saying to my kids after the election, our greatest enemies are cynicism and complacency. Um, and we all want to make a difference. We all want to get involved. We sort of s sort of don't know how to do that as individual citizens, but we know we should. And then when we do, we're not sure if we really make a difference. So Jen, um, you talked a little bit about some opportunities. What's, what about for actual individuals, for, for people who are citizens, who are just community people, how can they make a difference and what should they be doing? Um, so my uh, my husband always says that I love to make lists, um, and I particularly have noticed about myself in the last several weeks that I'm making a lot more lists. So I've decided that I like to make lists when I'm feeling worried. So I made a couple lists. Um, so I'm glad you asked because I have my lists. Um, so I'm actually going to answer two two questions. One is if you're a policymaker or an advocate, what do you do? And then the second, I will. Uh, okay. share my thoughts about what you do as an individual and obviously this room is full of people who are both <laughs> don't mean to suggest if you're an advocate you're not also an individual um, but sort of as a, as a guide for policymakers and advocates um, you know my number one suggestion is to make constant noise um, you know we have to keep pushing back I mean to, to Fatima's point um, we have to keep reminding our elected officials and everybody around us that bad things are happening if they're going to happen and to, to talk about it a lot um, second, and it sounds counterintuitive, or, or the converse of that is to fly under the radar in some areas, right? In some areas, we can just keep slowly making progress without anybody noticing, or keep stopping bad things from happening without anybody noticing. So you, at the same time as you're making noise in some areas, just fly under the radar in others. Um, third is um, build coalitions of like-minded advocacy groups and build support at the grassroots level. Um, fourth is looking for places where progress can be made, as I said, in the state and local level um, with foreign governments um, and philanthropists to prevent um, backsliding and um, federal inaction. Uh, f and fifth, um, to make uh, bipartisan or nonpartisan arguments for investing in women and girls where it makes sense. You know, this is something that some people may be uneasy um, about, um, you know, talking about why these issues are important to men, for example, why these issues are important generally to families, sort of appealing to men because they have daughters or mothers or, or, um, or sisters. And I, for one, have hated listening to some of those arguments. Um, but I think sometimes it's important to recognize that those, um, that, that narrative works. Um, you know, in foreign policy, what we did throughout our work at the State Department is talk about how women's issues are part of smart power. So not only is this an issue of human rights, but it's also an issue that's important to our national security. So I ask people to at least consider thinking about it that way as well. And as an individual, I guess I'd say, um, you know, to start by listening. Um, you know, one of the things I think we learned throughout the course of this campaign is that we are not probably listening enough to people who have different views from ours. Um, so we should start by doing that. Um, but by that, I don't mean um, to not argue or debate. So, you know, my number two um, 
a suggestion for individuals is is argue, right? Listen and then debate, and don't be afraid of discord. That's essential. Um, third, be a watchdog and use your voice. So when you see something that's wrong, whether it's in a neighborhood, a school, um, at your workplace, um, say something. Um, demand that political leaders take note, and you know, write a letter to the to the editor. Write an op-ed. Um, use your own voice. Fourth, volunteer or contribute. There's lots of organizations um, that um, are doing great work, and if you get involved and figure out which ones are the most meaningful to you, you can do you can help a lot by by simply volunteering or contributing. Fifth, uh, become politically active, um, which you know I've been heartened by the number of people, especially young women, who have come to me in recent days to say that they're either um, considering running for office for themselves. Yeah or trying to figure out how to support others <laughs> who want to run. Um, and then lastly, I, I heard Amal Clooney um, talk about everyday acts of feminism um, a couple of weeks ago. And I really, it really resonated with me. So, so my, my last piece of advice is sort of stand up for each other. Um, think about women's rights as, humans, as human rights. Um, and um, you know, get, we, we had this uh, phrase in the campaign, I'm with her. Um, let's make that phrase more about that candidate, this particular candidate, and more about this particular campaign and think about how we are all with her. Um, I think we should uh, start with some audience questions. Ma'am, why don't you go ahead? Yes, uh, I am a former Washingtonian. I now live in Florida. And um, w during the campaign, we had a lot of people come into Florida to help us. Unfortunately, the help wasn't enough, as you know. Um, but having been a former Washingtonian, I know that this is a very special group of people. and that um, because they don't have representation, voting representation in Congress, there's all this pent up um, <laughs> desire to do something. I know from having lived in Washington that, um, and also during this last campaign, people from Washington went to Virginia, they went to Pennsylvania, they went to other states to help work those states politically. And I'm wondering if there are any things you can say specifically that people here can do related to going into other states or anything of that nature that could continue this kind of momentum. Thank you. Fatima? Well, I'm happy to start. I, th I think you're absolutely right that the, the on the ground work in states, in communities really, to, to both um, build some infrastructure, have these sorts of teach-ins so that people are learning and get people excited about the issues is more, it's more important than, than ever because, um, again, to go back to whether we're talking about a Supreme Court justice or the Affordable Care Act, that, you know, calling from Washington, D.C. doesn't help very much, uh, but calling and, and, at, and showing up to members' offices, showing up to town halls, and being really locally engaged, that's what gets member of Congress's attention. So there's lots of ways that that is happening. Some of it is uh, work uh, between national organizations and state and local organizations who have already started that work to, to, uh, to help get more information and resources to local communities. Uh, but I, I think that you are absolutely right that uh, the on the ground game is where it's at. Um, I think one of you might have told me this, but Emily's List is running training programs now for people who are interested in running for office and just decided to launch these. Did, did you, one of you tell me this? No? Oh, uh, well, yes. I yeah. mean, I, I know that there are a bunch, there are a lot of organizations around the country, mm -hmm. national, places like Emily's List, um, also places um, Emerge, which has, which is a group that has state um, affiliates where they seek out and train women. I mean, depending on the organization, sometimes it's specifically Democratic pro-choice women, which is the case with Emily's List. Those are the candidates they, they endorse. In other places, it's, it's bipartisan. Um, but 
more broadly what you all can do with regard to those. So yes, look up those kinds of programs. If you need help finding them, you can actually, I, I think I guess you can, I think you can call Emily's List mm -hmm. and they will help you direct you, help to direct you to state and local places that do training programs. There's also just something you should practice. I, there are three things. One, really start to think about whether you yourself are somebody who wants to get it. If you're, if you're mad, if you're passionate, if you care about any one of these issues, really ask yourself, could I see my life in politics? And in fact, could I make a life that I would want in politics? Not just like, oh, the shiny kind of politician's life that seems very unappealing probably to most rational people. Um, <laughs> but like, could I be a new kind of politician? And I think we are seeing an influx of that, which I'm going to get to in a second. Secondly, look around you and see about the people in your lives who inspire you, who are compelling, persuasive, passionate on, on things you care about, people who might never have dreamed, and this is especially true for women, and it's especially true for women of color, who are never encouraged structurally ever by educators, by parents, you know, brilliant people who are never told like, oh, you should run for mayor, you should run for city council, right? They're never told that. That is so structurally important to why we have, a, a you know, white male leadership, top to bottom, state, local, federal. Um, so start looking around and thinking about the people. And it could be, you know, it could be a, a fellow teacher at your elementary school. It could be a cashier at your grocery store. It could be a friend of yours who you play bridge with. And if that person um, makes you think differently about the world, is compelling, is charismatic, is smart on the topics you care about, suggest to them that they think about running for office. And then the third part of this is educate yourself about the, the local and state politicians around you. Some of the most inspiring women that I know in American politics right now are people you pro whose names you may or may not know. Stacey Abrams in Georgia, um, who is, I, I like I, Ayanna Presley, who's a, who's a city councilwoman in Boston. These are, there are women and men um, with terrific politics who are bringing new life, who are redefining what a politician can be. And they're probably around you in your communities, on your city councils. Um, they are your, your state representatives. And they're not going to go further in politics unless they have money, support, and enthusiasm, and they're better known. And so one of the other things I tell people to do is investigate who the politicians who are around you, even the ones who aren't yet famous or high up. And if they're good and they represent you well, <laughs> Try to push them further. Sign up with them, work with them, volunteer, tell your friends about them, make them better known, donate to them. Um, so those are the things that I would say. And by the way, whoever it was who was telling me about Emily's List, what, I re what was interesting is that they put this up um, and, and immediately had uh, hundreds of people sign up to the point where they had to close it off and take a waiting list. So there's obviously people doing exactly what you're talking about, so that's great. She should run. Yes, she, yeah, yeah. yeah, she should run .org. Okay. Um, over here. Hi, Jill Gay, what works is a, what works for women.org. My question is a follow up to what you asked Jen, which is so many of us are here for the women's march and how do we use that to galvanize further action? It's it's related to what you were saying, but I think this is a special moment where there are so many people here. There was I'm sitting next to someone who came down from Alaska. So <laughs> Who is that? Who came right from Alaska? Oh my God, that's amazing, wow. Incredible. Stand up, stand up so everybody can see you. Woo! Wow. <laughs> Incredible. Well, that's a great question. Would, who would like to uh, take a stab at that? Well, I, I can start, I, I guess, I, I'll uh, pair it with a worry. So I think that we need to figure out how to keep this energy. Um, you know, and I was the one who said, I don't think we'll ever be complacent ag again, but I do worry that we will become complacent again, right? Um, and, you know, to, to Rebecca's point, you know, the, the good news is that I think feminism has enough room for everybody and the women's movement has enough room for everybody, but we are under assault, right? And every issue that you think about, um, you know, legally and and um, and individually 
um, there there is a risk. So we have to figure out how to divide our resources and divide our energy. And I think, you know, one of the things, I mean, the, the, the short answer to your question is that, you know, on Sunday, I know a lot of organizations are running trainings about what do you do when you get back home. So we should all go to those trainings. Um, but the longer answer is we need to, um, to keep thinking about how to keep it, the momentum going and to, um, and to think about how in the area that you feel that you can make the most contribution to, um, you keep working, understanding that other people are addressing other issues. Um, I want to see who has an audience question, and Lily is right over here with the bike. If you're in the middle, okay, right there, and then Susie, I'll come back to you in a second. Hi, my name is Nancy Buck. I'd like to add to uh, Jennifer Klein's list. I think it's important that as many people as possible subscribe in print or digitally to the Washington Post, the New York Times, yes. or any other Absolutely. responsible That's a really good addition. media. They need the resources to cover these people. Very, very good point. And I would add any organization that uh, is representing a cause that you feel passionately about, they need a lot of money to fight this fight. So open up your wallets if you can. Susie. Hi. You all are Can you talk into the mic? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can til tilt it up. I'm Susie Blaustein. Uh, run a women's organization, international women's organization. I teach about women and, in cities. And you all are fabulous. Thank you so much for coming. And that includes you, Lissa. You were, it was wonderful. And we're all oh, very you. grateful for everything you've taught us and gotten us to think about. I think my question is more tactical or strategic. Um, you focused mostly, as one would when you're under assault, on the core issues, reproductive rights, workplace, schools, a physical assault, et cetera, that what we think of as women's issues. And there was sort of passing mention of LGBTQ issues and environmental justice and climate change and a much broader panoply of issues. And your State Department, and actually it was when she was First Lady, that we learned from First Lady Hillary Clinton that women's rights are human rights, as you said, Ms. Klein. And so I'm, my question is, and you talked about broad, broader based progressive coalitions. Do we, do you feel that it's important to sort of keep the brand in the, common, in the sort of marketplace nomenclature of women's issues, knowing that that's going to turn off some people? Or is it maybe better? Or also, d do we build a broader coalition of groups where women's rights are indeed human rights and environmental justice is a woman's rights when she's homeless and her child is having mold poisoning, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess that's my question because we're always torn and it's wonderful tomorrow that so many people are coming, women and climate, women, all these different groups, but then how do we keep that bit going that's much broader than the core issues? Thank you. Great question, Susie. Fatima. So I am in the camp of people that believes it's still okay to say women even after this election and, I, and there's disagreement over, over that. But I, I actually think what's important, though, is to, ex to, to define what that is. And this, the, I was really excited when I saw that the march adopted the women's rights are human rights framework. Human rights are women's rights, human and rights women's rights are human rights would be the exact quote. Just saying. <laughs> so. But I thought it was important to adopt great. it so that people could be clear and see themselves and find themselves and understand that they could and did have a connection to the women's movement and to women's issues. On the other hand, I think the point that I think you raised, Jen, about uh, sometimes we have forgotten to tell the story about how many issues are, you know, they are deep family economic security issues. They are deep community issues. And so I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> but but I think it's important to do to do both because if maybe if we lean too far the other way and don't tell the full story, um, not everyone will see themselves in this movement. And I think it's important that that happen. Can I just interject before we get to the next audience question? Because it's making me think of something that you've also all touched on and um, sort of terrifyingly, actually, which is this idea that sort of the divide and conquer strategy is intentional. And as we all know, looking around the world over history, but especially recently very effective, and obviously has been effective, should that 
notion be part of the narrative? In other words, should we be warning ourselves as vocally as possible that this is by design what this administration is trying to do to all of us and thus almost galvanize and collectivize ourselves around that, resisting that possibility? I think. I, well, I think that we're going to have to expect it and name it. I think yeah, what, you know, one of the things that we saw in the first couple of weeks in January is an initial effort to say, we're going to hold every hearing for every cabinet nominee on the same day. So the, and, and you know, that didn't actually happen, but I, th I thought, it, you know, even the suggestion that they would try to do that uh, was an important one. And it was sort of, a, okay, well, maybe I only have an opportunity to focus just on one thing, it was a real effort to divide. In the end, I think what we've seen is, A, those, these hearings have dragged out longer than they initially said they would, but, but people have been able to walk and chew gum and to be able to talk about uh, the fact that each of these nominees has a different situation going on and also draw the connections between them. I've so seen really powerful work to draw the anti-LGBT connection across several different nominees and tell that story or powerful work to do the same around where, uh, you know, where different nominees are in terms of um, anti-choice in terms of um, violence. That I, I think being able to uh, connect the thread is going to be all the more important because of intention spans, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Rebecca, you were going to say something too. Well, I just want to say that your point about we can walk and chew gum at the same time, I actually think we have to be really aggressive about taking that. So the, the big umbrella idea, women's rights are human rights, human rights are women's rights. We have to all in this room and when you talk to people and when you do your work, we need to get better as a country and as the left to the degree that I'm guessing most people in this room are on the left, however you define it, um, at, at pointing out both of those things that, that yes women's rights are economic issues and economic issues are women's issues and issues of race and it's right this is one of the things nothing drives me crazier and this has always been true than the notion that there are culture war issues like abortion or social issues like reproductive rights as if it's about like girl stuff you know like sex and the church and babies or whatever and separated from the notion and we have seen such an abundance abundance of this thought since the election and it has been chilling to me because it's coming from the progressive the progressive front lines right it is coming from those on the left who are saying we have to step away from these identity issues and get back to economic issues it is coming i i heard bernie sanders say it yeah. in a in a town hall not two weeks ago sure we might not agree on things like abortion but when it comes to economic issues we can find common ground with trump voters <laughs> we all of us. So it's it's our responsibility if we understand how reproductive autonomy is an economic issue. If we understand how minimum wage increases disproportionately affect women and women of color and unmarried women who are disproportionately women of color and single mothers, if we understand that that economic issue, the fight for 15, is a women's issue, then it is incumbent on all of us to shift the way we talk about that and say, you are creating false binaries here mm -hmm. when you're talking about how Black Lives Matter was too loud and it scared us off the economic issues. No, no, Black Lives Matter is an economic issue. So. <laughs> Anyway, I think that's our job um, within the women's movement, which I think, as, I, as we've all said, is a women's movement that is also about race and climate and criminal justice and all of these things. We must uh, walk and chew gum so loudly and fiercely about the fact, <laughs> like really irritate everyone with the gum chewing. <laughs> and don't be afraid to irritate people about it, to point out over and over again, these are false distinctions. That's my, yeah. And if I could just add, to that, because you know, I sometimes have been accused of being too subtle. That <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's an example, but that's our job within the movement's movement, and that's the job if, of the movement that maybe doesn't call itself the women's movement. That's the job of the economic justice yes. movement more broadly. Right. Yes, and hold people to it. All right. Next question. Hi. Thank you. Um, I had two quick questions. 
The first is um, a couple weeks ago online, the New York Times did an overall profile of several of the 53% of the women who voted for Trump. Mm -hmm. And what I found so disturbing about the profiles was to a person, um, no one, none of them mentioned anything about his character. And I just find it so odd that women, all those women didn't have anything to say about his character. They, they just mentioned one or two issues they identified with. So I wanted your opinions on that because I think as women, we should be, you know, as caretakers, as people who care about each other, we should be extremely concerned about the president's character. The second thing is, especially from those of you who know Hillary, I'm just curious what you think about her attending the inauguration. I was a little surprised. I may be naive. She wore white. She wore white. I hope you all noticed. Um, I don't want to say she was too good to go, but I certainly would, have, would not have blamed her for not going. Um, I just wonder what you think about that. What motivated her to attend? I'll answer the first <laughs> second. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. <laughs> on, on your first question, I, I read the same pieces and I had the same reaction. And it is really, um, actually I had been thinking about this for a long time, but it really crystallized in my mind that one of the things we need to do in this country um, is change social attitudes because we just elected a person who sexually assaulted women and bragged about it, and that was not disqualifying. And it wasn't even disqualifying to 53% of white women, right? And that sh needs, to, we need to reach a point where that is totally unacceptable, where something like that, or even things that he said and did that were far less egregious than that, would disqualify somebody. So I don't have the answer, um, but I had the same reaction and the sort of the same view that this is this is deeper. And so you know we need to change laws and we need to uh, or or enforce laws and we need to have good policies. But we also need to work on the social attitudes that underlie those laws and policies. And I'm going to turn to you on that <laughs> second one. <laughs> we might have different views on this. But really. We agree on everything, Jen, don't we? <laughs> um, it's really smart for me to agree with Jen because she knows way more than I do. No, I, you know, it's you a know. really tough question about the inauguration, and um, I've really tried actually not to comment on it because it's. I feel so kind of conflicted, both as a person, but also as somebody who, if I were asked for my advice of of whether she should go as a person, I would really want her not to go because, like, why would you go and have to sit there and have this person who has been nothing but disrespectful and has debased the office of the presidency before he's even gotten there and has been demeaning to women and has been ungracious to a fault, why would you go and take the high road? Because, honestly, it's kind of a whole different ballgame right now in terms of what is normal. Um, on the other hand, you know, Jen and I were talking about this earlier this was reminding us of earlier things watching her sit there uh, when she's had to kind of be the stoic woman in the face of some, you know, in some people's views, humiliation. Um, and she's magnificent in these situations in, in the sense of her self-discipline, her resilience, her incredible strength, um, her poise, and her grace, right? I mean, she has a kind of dignity about her in these situations that is absolutely mind-boggling um, and I think you know so part of me as a woman is like you know what it's like the Benghazi hearing right 11 hours of these people all attacking the heck out of her and trying to make her slip up and trying to find fault with her and just dr you know drumming up things and by the end of it you know they're all red-faced and sweating and she's like next question next question and so as a model of womanhood actually she's pretty unparalleled in yeah. these situations of, you know, where women are put in these situations that are meant to humiliate them, you know, where they're supposed to just sort of sit there and, you know, look nice and, you know, whatever. And I think she, the way she carries herself, she manages to do, you know, to come across in a different way that I find very inspiring, actually, almost as a form of resistance. And I thought, personally, the white coat was a subtle and dignified statement that was unmistakable. And, you know, and this Jen and I said, and then those other people had the nerve to wear white coats too, like as if they represent the same history on women's rights, honestly, but whatever. Um, so I feel very conflicted about it because there's part of me that's like, why would anybody have to do this and go and, and sit there? On the other hand, I think overall she did have to. And I think the way she did was amazing and actually in its own bizarre way kind of inspiring. So 
you know. Turns out we do agree. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, are there any questions from the fiction room? Yeah, or Lily? No, no. Somebody back there, though? Okay, yep. Now we need you to talk in the mic or turn it on. Okay. Ready? Okay. Uh, so I'm looking for glimmers of hope. So I was wondering what any of you make of uh, Rick Perry's like 180 or 90 degree turn <laughs> where he sat with Secretary or former Secretary of Energy Ernest Moniz and learned something new that he didn't know before. And all of a sudden he's going to take a different stance at the Department of Energy and not do what he's been soundbiting, soundbiting, that he would say he'd be doing. So are you uh, asking the past if there's hope? Like if somebody, is there a glimmer? Is this, can they actually, can people actually change in this? Not situation? just, not just, you know, for him, but is there a glimmer of, a glimmer of hope in that, you know, if, if all of us were to talk to people like Secretary Ernest Moniz did to Rick Perry, maybe is that a glimmer of hope that this is how we make the change? that they didn't know, and now they suddenly, you know, Gloria Steinem always said she, she was really naive, right? Because she thought if we just explain things, everybody would just kind of fall over and get it. And yet that's what looks like Secretary Ernest Moniz did. He sort of sat down, explained things, and Rick Perry, you know, a light shone, and now he's understanding. Is, is this a glimmer of hope? Can we all replicate that, all of us? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I have to say that the particular example of Rick Perry, I don't find hopeful. <laughs> but and and in fact, wait, 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 wait. I, I mean, I will. But it's perhaps a particular example rather than the process you're describing, right? So there was actually somebody. It was on Twitter, and I retweeted her, and I think it was Lauren Kelly from Rolling Stone. I hope I'm who said God grant me the confidence of a white man about to take yeah. over a federal agency. <laughs> he literally doesn't understand. Um, so, so the particular, like, I'm, I am not moved by the notion that after agreeing to take over the agency, he then sat down with a learned person <laughs> and discovered what the agency did. Um, <laughs> but, but, there is another example that I found very moving from earlier in the campaign, um, earlier in the back before the bad, um, <laughs> when we were in a different kind of bad. After the, not the, it wasn't the pussy tape, it was the, the allegations that followed. Um, and I don't know how many of you shared this experience. I found that uh, the, one of the more traumatic political periods of my life, like viscerally horrible, the period of the campaign after which the women had made allegations about Trump, those dozen or more women had told their very detailed stories about what he'd done to them. And there was this discussion and there were sort of social media campaigns where everybody was saying, this, oh, this is when I was harassed, this is when I was assaulted. And there was a phenomenon that I heard about, not just from like, does, from, from scores of people, from men, who had no idea what a universal experience this was for women. And because of that conversation that happened nationally, learned. I talked to a former governor and senator in the course of my work who said that his wife had to say, of course I've been you know, harassed on a subway. And this was a shock to him. This is a man who is, you know, in the second half of his life, who it had never, these are things that for a lot of women in this room are, are genuinely everyday realities. And it turns out that many of the men who we, who we live with and love, our friends, our brothers, our partners, our fathers, had no idea that this is like Tuesday for us, right? <laughs> and I, and so that, that moment, I think, would be, I, I, and I think a hell of a lot of men, I think a lot of men who are probably in this room today, and there are a good number of them, I think you're going to see a lot of men tomorrow, and I think that a lot of them have learned and become radicalized, and I, I have seen shifts in men um, and how they think and talk about women and gender and women in politics and gendered representation. I have seen men, white, black, 
Latino radicalized and educated by what this country has just experienced. And so I do have hope for that kind of the, the possibility of storytelling, making change and learning. I just don't know that I attach that hope to Rick Perry. <laughs> um, okay, so we are, we are sort of winding down. We have a couple questions at the mics and we'll take one more. If you could keep your questions very short, that would be great. And then we'll close it out uh, once we're done with questions. Well, I'll ask each of our panelists for a, a final thought. But um, okay, so we have two people here, three people. Very, very, very quick questions. Two people here or one? How many? One? Okay. And yeah, we have a young person who's about to talk right here. And we'll do one more from the back. Go ahead, Katie. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie. I'm a student and an aspiring politician. <laughs> that was cool. Um, <laughs> so I'm, we've talked a lot today about policy and about moving forward. But I, Jen, wanted to ask you a little bit about the social attitude. Um, what are we supposed to do about the fact that so many people don't care about sexual harassment and that they don't care about these issues and the fact that so many people didn't vote, I mean people my age didn't vote and didn't see these issues as important enough to actually go and do something about. Oh, of course that's the hardest question. Um, I guess what I would say is, I speaking of hope, I have at least some hope that having seen what we've just seen, maybe that will change a little bit. And it's all of our job to keep reminding people what's at stake, right? I mean, which I think is going to be pretty easy for the next, hopefully, not more than four years and hopefully less. Um, but we're going to see on a daily basis the cost of not voting. We're going to see somebody who can't help himself but say and do pretty awful things. And that constant reminder, sadly, I think is going to keep people motivated. Um, and, you know, I, I think that the, the, discussion after, I, I could not agree with you more, the discussion after the, the Access Hollywood tapes, um, you know, you couldn't find a woman who wasn't talking to other women about, of course, I've had this experience, and many, many <laughs> men talking to women that they know and saying, either I'm surprised or I'm not surprised at all, but I'm sorry. And, um, you know, so I think that's sort of the, the, the irony of all of this may be that the situation we find each other our, ourselves in is that there is sort of a, um, a constant reminder, for, for lack of a better word, a common enemy, and that is hopefully going to be extremely motivating over the next however many years we have to endure this. Thanks, Jen. Right here. Um, hi. Well, first of all, thank you so much for putting this together. It's thank you lovely. for coming. I have um, a very short commentary leading into a question for Jennifer. Very short. We are obviously in trouble here. We know that. Um, I'd like to highlight that if we are in trouble, the state of the world and the state of women and girls um, internationally, it's just even so much worse. The impact that the past eight years has had for humanitarian aid, for highlighting gender-based violence issues worldwide, it's just incredible. And I think, um, I work on GBV in, in conflict zones. Uh, their security enhances our security. When women and girls are secure overseas, we are more secure. So. What you said that we should be doing to try to push the legislative agenda, not everything that this administration has done for women and girls um, internationally actually depends on Congress. So much of what has been done safe from the start, the national strategy, the, the national action plan for women, peace and security, the GBV strategy, um, that can all just be done away with, with the stroke of a pen, I assume. And Congress has no power over that. How do we fight against that? So uh, gender-based violence. violence. <laughs> so of course, this is exactly what I spent four years working on at the State Department. And, and um, y you're exactly right. But I'm going to add some hope, which is that I think, and I'm not sure I can explain why, but I think that, um, ironically, those issues are safer. Um, be, because somehow we are not threatened by those people over there. Um, we um, probably will. Um, not invest as much money. Um, we will certainly um, take steps backward. Um, on the other hand, in my list of things that you know policymakers should keep in the backs of your minds, I think that um, 
that this is this may be you know knock on wood this may be one of those issues that you can fly under the radar screen and 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 keep doing good things although he, although the trump transition did ask for a list of yes. people working on gbv yes. at so the state department and that's the only <laughs> list that they asked for yeah not just gbv mm. of anybody working on gender equality at the state department um, so that was worrisome. Um, that remains worrisome, um, and I don't mean to uh, suggest otherwise. Um, you know, on the other hand, they have at least hired one person who I know personally who actually cares about global women's issues, and I'm going to hope that she um, keeps her eye and and gets the ear of people who matter. Um, and you know, I think. Some issues are harder than others. I think gender-based violence is very visceral for people. So I think, you know, again, I, as I say, ironically, I think that's one issue where, um, you know, when you look at women in conflict, it's really hard to uh, to, d to disagree that we should invest in um, in women and girls in conflict zones. Um, I also think um, economic participation is an area where there has been. Um, bipartisan support. There's been, you know, a lot of nonpartisan work on this. Even Exxon Mobil. You know, if you look at our our incoming Secretary of State, you know, and I don't mean to be any sort of apologist for 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 anybody. Um, you know, I'm going to see what they do, and I will be the first one at their door, um, in whatever form I can I can get there. Um, but Exxon Mobil, as a corporation, actually had a huge initiative on women's economic participation. So again, you know, let's hope that. That's an issue where um, where at least progress will will not be stopped. And if I, if I could just add to that on one point that you raise, it's for this issue, but more broadly, um, we need to be engaging, right? Because you need to be engaging directly with them and setting out the expectation of what you expect to happen internationally, but for domestic issues, what we expect to happen. Um, we need to be shining a light on what it is they do. Members of Congress, there are things members of Congress can do, even when they're, we're talking about executive actions. They can ask questions. They can request information. They can help us to shine a light. So I just, I, I don't want, um, I know that the now president has been saying, on day one, I'm doing a million things, and all of it will just happen. There are things that, that um, on purpose, slow that down. We had a question in the back. Good afternoon. My name is Shirley. I just drove in from Atlanta, Georgia. Woo, wow. wow. Great. Welcome. Just to get here, I was praying I didn't get a ticket, and I didn't. I thank the Lord for that. Um, I want to commend you for the teaching. I think it's an excellent concept. Um, I also wanted to put out there that University of Rutgers is also having a ready to run program to train young people and all persons that are interested in uh, become, getting involved in politician, uh, po politics. Uh, my question is, I heard uh, several of the panelists mention about women's rights or human rights. Is there any movement to um, encourage or uh, force gov uh, the government to implement uh, international human rights such as CEDA and CURD to ratify them. <laughs> I don't want to end on a, on a sad not, We have note. one more question, so answer quickly, and then we'll go to the a more, okay, a question that might elicit a more positive response. The, the, the quick answer is um, that's a difficult road. Um, you know, we haven't gotten CEDAR ratified under a Democratic president for the last eight years, and if anybody looks around, it's pretty hard to get um, the Senate to do anything, let alone ratify a treaty. So I am not particularly optimistic that there's going to be um, CEDAR ratification anytime soon. Okay. Um, okay. Though you, you two are the last two questions, so um, keep them short if you don't mind. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. It occurs to me there must be uh, Republican women who voted for Trump but don't feel comfortable with it and would like to restore a more moral, traditional Republican party. Um, we could potentially work with them, and in particular, it occurs to me we might take a leaf out of the uh, Tea Party's book and try to threaten primarying existing members of Congress from the left. 
not, so to speak, uh, from the more traditional version. We've seen how effective this was in getting them to vote uh, against, uh, for more um, uh, absolute alt-right uh, issues. Maybe it would work in the other way around. Rebecca? I, I hope, I mean, I hope what we see is movement coming from the left. I hope, uh, you know, useful, um, smart primaries. Um, as far as convincing women who voted for Trump, some of the most fascinating research that's been done, and I think it's been done by the same pollster um, who who Jen was making reference to in an earlier answer, some of, there's been focus groups um, that were done with Trump voters in the Midwest who support Planned Parenthood. And the focus groups, which were post-election, um, in the discussions, they the, these women and men were told that the administration, one of the first things it wants to do is defund Planned Parenthood. And um, these the women in particular were horrified. They were horrified. Um, now, this is not, there is the impulse to be like, what were you thinking? What was wrong with you? But but I think it actually, we have to go to, my take on this would be we have to change how we do politics. We have been way too reticent in this country about running on things like reproductive rights access. It was inc it was remarkable to see Hillary in the primary, and it was because it was an issue to which she was to the left of Bernie Sanders. That's what a left primary can do, that she ran on opposition to Hyde. And she was, I mean, it was, my dr it was a dream. It was not, Barbara Lee in Congress had introduced something called the Each Woman Act the year before aiming to repeal the Hyde Amendment. M resistance to Hyde, which prevents federal dollars from being federal insurance programs for paying for abortion, which means that poor women and disproportionately women of color don't have access to abortion, to affordable abortion care in this country. Um, it has been, a it's a rider that's approved every year. Um, it has been so accepted, people have not challenged it. Uh, even Obama called it a tradition. Um, opposition to, but that's, I mean, that's, he's not unusual in that. Joe Biden voted for it. I mean, <laughs> this is not, um, this is, it, it, the Hyde Amendment was tradition. Nobody challenged it. It's Barbara Lee began to build a movement in, um, in Congress, and then Hillary, seeing a place where she could get to Bernie's left in that primary, ran on it and was explicit about its racial and economic implications, and it was an incredible thing to see. Now, that is a bold move that we have not really seen clearly. People are still too nervous to run on, because Republicans have had such victories when it comes to opposing contraception, making abortion less accessible. We need to get bolder about reaching some of those people, those women who voted for Trump, who if they knew, because people had actually had the guts to campaign, people have been too scared to campaign on what we have historically called women's issues or controversial. We need to get better about explaining that the majority supports this stuff, that, that the majority is in favor of Roe, that the majority is in favor, and that's something that some of the, Elise Hogue at NARAL and, and Cecile Richards at Planned Parenthood, they were really pushing this year, campaign more aggressively on reproductive rights. Don't be afraid of talking about it. And I think that's an instance where the, I, I'm using a particular, the reproductive rights, Thing. We saw it also with Bernie's campaign and the fight for 15 and, and wage equality. <coughs> I do think there are openings if we take them smartly and strategically and with, with a kind of authentic passion where we're m making those moves from the left does have a chance to reach people on the other side of the aisle. We just have to be smart about how we do it and where we do it. So we should encourage and train Republican women in Republican districts to run also. Okay. I, I, <laughs> I don't think that's what she said, but whatever. Well, no, I just wanted, I, Go ahead. And if I could just add to the story that you're telling, because I think it's an important one, is that over the last couple of years, that groundwork at a community level and those conversations have been laid by the reproductive justice movement in a variety of spaces, local conversations where they were talking and explaining what Hyde was and why it was a, a particular problem for low-income women and women of color. And so that's how you get all of these members moving to the left, and I don't think we're gonna go back. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we have time for one more question. Yeah, if you could ask the question, and then I would like you, as you answer the question, each of you to have a parting thought um, before we close off this. And one thing that I would just throw out there is, how do we keep uh, the sexism that we've seen in the campaign, the fact that the new president in his inaugural address never mentioned women or anything about them, not to mention the person he beat in the election, um, and how do we keep that from being normalized? But go ahead. Okay. 
I'm sorry to be at the last one here. Um, first, I want to thank the woman that talked about gender-based violence and the international sphere, because I know that um, Trump invited the alt-right, the official representatives of all the alt-right groups from Europe, um, to be at his, as, at his inauguration. So I think it's important for us to think internationally. Um, I'm, I'm a senior going to run for local office in inner city Philadelphia. Um, I think, pretty sure. Uh, so um, yes, we have to move from the grassroots. I come from an international background though, went through the Reagan era, transition era, where I worked on legal rights for women in Central America, and that got erased off the map. They stamped it Ill not following the agenda of the Reagan administration, defunded it. But the good note of this is that the Ford Foundation picked it up and ran with it, and we had a bigger program than we would have ever had with USAID funding. And so my question is, because we then worked in every continent around the world where women lawyers learned how to work for legal rights in their particular parts of the world. My question is, you guys are very well connected. There was a lot of money supporting Hillary's campaign. I want to know where the money is. I want to know where those donors are standing on some of these issues now, and are they organizing? We're being told to organize. We're told to get our acts together. They need to get their acts together, too, and I'd like some insight on that, because that is going to give us the strength to move forward. Thank you. Jen? I think, I think the good news is that they are doing exactly that. I mean, all, all the um, major foundations, philanthropies, private corporations have been meeting in various ways, shape, or form to figure out what their part is here. So I actually feel very excited about the possibility of two things. One is that they're going to step up their investments, and second is that they're going to think about how to coordinate their investments so that they are um, done in the most effective way possible, which has been, you know, done sometimes and not done other times um, with the major philanthropic organizations. And I think they're very focused on sort of dividing up the pie. So I feel very optimistic about that. And it sort of relates to my, my final point, um, which is, you know, how do, we, how do we approach this moment? What is the name of the book that you were, what do we do now? Um, you know, I, I sort of return to where I started, um, which is, you know, everybody needs to do their job. Philanthropy needs to invest more. Um, advocates need to advocate more and individuals need to take action and you know I I really think that if we I, I I'm the very not optimistic right now I'm very pessimistic right now but I think that 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 is our opportunity and um, and you know not to get complacent at this time and I want to also just end by thanking Lissa and Brad and politics and prose and all of you <laughs> Thank because you. I have at several moments looked out at this crowd um, and gotten uh, choked up thinking about the opportunity that is in this room alone. Thank you, Jen. Um, uh, by the way, before we are completely over, I just want to tell you that uh, we have copies of both of Rebecca's books. She will be happy to sign them, right? Sure. Um, <laughs> Now she has to say yes um, afterwards. Uh, so take a look at those. Take a look at our display table. And um, next to last word. OK, so very quickly, what I don't know about donors is vast. So the only thing I can say is that I hope the wealthiest Americans who are about to receive wonderful tax cuts um, take all that extra money and you know, put it in directions that they need it. Uh, I would also say that I am just as glad that he did not talk about women or Hillary Clinton. I feel like an old Yenta it's saying, like, get my name out of his mouth. I, I like. <laughs> I. Um. <laughs> might be the only good thing about the day. <laughs> so, um. It is a good thing about the day. And then as for the, the parting thought going forward, I think that um, what Jen said about don't get complacent, I also, I have a slightly, um, a, a very related idea, which is don't get, don't get distant from it. Um, there's a thing that we all do, and it's not just, and, and complacency, and this is something that, you know, movement leaders have said to me, like, look, we all psychologically need to take breaks. When things are good, we relax a little bit. And it's okay. That's not a bad thing. It's not a sin, you know. 
Um, it was a tremendous thing to elect Barack Obama. It really was. I mean, it was better than the, I thought. The, I didn't know we had it in us. Um, I didn't know we had it in us to vote for Hillary Clinton by 2.8 million more votes. Uh, but I think that there's a distance that's very appealing. Like I live in Brooklyn. I live in um, I live in like the, if you pick the most bourgeois, the bubble. Although I'm I could rage about the whole bubble thing and who lives in a bubble and who doesn't. I'm not going to. But I live in like but I do live in like if you you know imagine Brooklyn. I live there, and <laughs> and I walked past a shirt yesterday in a boutique um, that said in memory of when I cared. Whoa. Yeah. And I and I got it. I get it, right? Like there's a we especially in a contemporary world, given our social media, our media, the patterns of of dialogue and expression and how we communicate with each other. And I'm not anti irony. I like irony. I like humor. <laughs> um, but I think that we can fall on distance and and that this is not the time to be distant. And so stay close and be and like be earnest when it comes to this stuff. Be ironic when it comes to like your personal friendships, whatever. You know, be ironic when it suits you and like your TV preferences. But but <laughs> but when it comes to these things, like it is so it's it's we had eight years where it was not everything was perfect. God, he he you know n nobody's perfect. <laughs> But we had eight years where we could relax. And that is, and I think a lot of us don't even remember what it was like before we relaxed. And I think we're going to remember really quickly. Just so, but, but care. And I just want to say for the record, I am really glad Trump said nothing about Hillary today. In the, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> we disagree. Go ahead. Well, this was a wonderful way to in today so thank you oh, thank and, you and thank you to politics and prose um we are going to be asking a lot of everyone in this period we're going to keep coming back and asking people to make phone calls write letters <laughs> show up at town hall meetings there is a lot of worry that um that people won't show up that they'll get tired or uh, at, or that we will be asking too much. And so my ask for all of you, or the all of you more broadly who's on Facebook, is, is to keep showing up. So thank you. And can I just end with one other thought? Thank you all. This is, aren't they amazing, by the way? They're the best. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, I, I would just like to offer, for those of you who were at the Teaching on Civil Liberties, you will have heard this, but one of the most compelling things that was said at the very end was the following. And I think it's a good thing to keep in mind at moments like this. Hope is, uh, hope is a consequence of action, oh. not a motivation for action, right? Hope is a consequence of it. So if we're sitting here waiting to feel hopeful, we're not gonna do anything. So if you wanna feel hopeful, do something. So I think to echo um, all, Rebecca and Fatima and uh, Jen, um, you know, we all have our part to play. We all can make a difference in however we wish, small or large, hopefully, you know, <laughs> to, together, stronger together, we will uh, be able to move this country forward and, and protect these rights from being dismantled. So thank you all so much for coming out. And uh, all of you who are marching tomorrow, onward and be safe. And thank you for coming. <laughs>